you can still buy 6 core CPUs based on the 14 nanometer process in 2023, like brand new, in box, with a warranty and everything. In fact, despite Intel having made chips on this node for some 8 years at this point, it's still only one iteration removed from their current bleeding edge CPUs. Nobody would blame you for buying one of these 10th and 11th Gen i5s for gaming today, especially if you're on a budget. So, if I told you there was one Intel 14 nanometer 6 core, an overclockable one even, available for half the price of a newer non-K chip, you'd assume there's a catch, right? There's gotta be a catch. Well, actually, there's more than one. I didn't have the easiest time with the i7-6800K, despite years of personal experience and word of mouth telling me that overclocking is always best achieved via the BIOS, that option wasn't open to me. Every OC I dialed in from my Gigabyte G1 Gaming's BIOS failed to take hold, always returning to the default 3.8GHz. One of my goals in this series of CPU tests is to try and normalise them to 4.5GHz wherever possible. I managed this in the Sandy Bridge and Sandy Bridge E CPUs, Ivy Bridge E, even Haswell E on this exact motherboard had no issues, so it was pretty important to me that I try and squeeze some extra clocks out of this Broadwell E CPU. Broadwell was the first architecture from Intel using 14 nanometer lithography, a process node that would remain key to Intel's CPUs for six years. It's tempting to look on this period of Intel history as one of stagnation, but in truth, they made some significant refinements to the various architectures built on this process. While late generation Rocket Lake chips could push 14 nanometers to 5 gigahertz and beyond, I failed to reach my 4.5 gigahertz target. After downloading an older version of Intel XTU, I was able to get my OCs to take, but I couldn't get a stable frequency above 4.3 gigahertz. Now, with a pretty big disparity between the clock speeds of Intel's 2020 era chips and this 2016 model, I didn't have the highest of hopes. However, the 6800K still has a few factors going in its favour. As is the norm for HEDT chips, Intel's Broadwell E CPUs had larger than normal level 3 caches, and this i7's 15 megabytes outweighs the 9 to 12 megabytes of some of the succeeding 6 cores. If you saw my last CPU review on the i7-5775C, you'll know that it was also based on Broadwell and had a massive 128 megabytes of EDRAM on board, which it could use as a level 4 cache. You might be thinking that Broadwell E might have had that too. Alas, that isn't the case. The EDRAM was ostensibly there to benefit the desktop CPU's integrated graphics, which the 2011 V3 chips don't have. For memory, I was able to run four 8GB sticks in quad channel to gain higher memory bandwidth. Even though I could only clock them up to 3200 mega transfers a second, this should still outperform all but the fastest dual channel DDR4. Rounding out the test system specs, I kept the CPU cool using an old Cooler Master 240mm AIO, powered everything with a 1000 watt EVGA GQ power supply, and the GPU is my usual Gigabyte RTX 3070. Perhaps as a result of not hitting my 4.5GHz target, this scenario may be one you have to get used to over the course of this video. In Valorant, the i7-6800K manages a terrific 255fps, exceedingly playable and perfect for pairing with a high refresh monitor, but noticeably slower than a 5930K clocked at 4.5GHz. If the 6800K could clock that high, I dare say it would do as well or even better, but in my case that just wasn't happening. On the positive side, it's a good 20% faster than earlier generation 6 cores. Battlefield 5 sees the 6800K extend its lead over old school 6 cores like the 3960X. Thanks, no doubt, to its AVX2 compatibility and improved IPC, the 155fps average is some 40% faster than the Sandy Bridge chip. It's still a little worse than the 5930K, but not so much in averages, which are basically equal. 
the 6800K suffers a little worse in the 1% lows, though again, this is most likely down to the lower clock speeds. Fortnite, however, is a great result for the 6800K. This is a functional match for the 200 MHz higher clocked 5930K and actually sees slightly higher minimums, though of course expecting consistent 1 and 0.1% lows in a large scale online game is a little unrealistic. If you have better luck on the Silicon Lottery than I did, you may even see an advantage at higher clock speeds. Flight simulators results on higher end CPUs are mostly academic, as people flying these sims don't care all that much about high FPS. However, I'm here to compare CPU performance, mostly academic is my middle name. Averages once more match the previous gen 6 core at about 50 FPS, the ideal frame rate for smooth gameplay do not at me. It does score a little lower at the minimum end, but this isn't sim breaking by any stretch of the imagination. The 6800K joins the elite few in my CPU archive that can handle Spider-Man Remastered in both standard and ray traced modes. The latter is more demanding, naturally, but the Broadwell E-chip can average approximately 60 FPS. 1% and 0.1s drop significantly, but then again I've yet to see a setup in which they don't. Without RT, the 6800K falls a few places in the rankings. Older CPUs like the 3960X and E5 1680V2 seem to do much better when RT isn't involved, but while the 6800K can't really make a case for itself against other chips on the same socket, it can still offer a great near 90fps experience. Despite its fearsome reputation, Cyberpunk 2077 doesn't seem to mind older architectures all that much. Or alternatively, I suppose it's possible that I've yet to find an arch new enough to satisfy it. Either way, the 6800K sees some stiff competition from some surprising chips. The non-RT result of 66 FPS on average places it just about equal to the Sandy Bridge i7-3960X, but just below the 10-core Ivy Bridge 2680V2. Once RT is factored in, however, the older chips fall away, as the 6800K joins the Haswell E's and even the Zen 3 at the top of the table. Red Dead Redemption 2 is another excellent result for the i7-6800K, averaging a very robust 77fps on average, though with 1 and 0.1% characteristic of lower clocked chips. Sadly, as playable a result as this is, it is blown away by the Haswell Ease. I'm not even sure I can explain this, the 5930K shouldn't be over 10% faster than the newer chip, even if it is about 4% higher clocked. I did test with Elden Ring, but like most higher end chips, the result was a margin of error difference from the others, so I'll move right along to the Witcher 3 Remastered. In DX12 at 1440 Ultra with DLSS balanced, the 6800K does top the chart with a very playable 63 FPS and with lows in the 40s. However, I haven't actually tested the Haswell Ease in this title, so maybe the 6800K shouldn't celebrate too soon? Finally, at an average turn time of 6.87 seconds, the Civ 6 results are extremely close to both the i7-5930K and the E5-1680V2. In fact, the age of the game might account for why it tolerates older architectures so well, because the i7-3960X is only a little behind its newer relative, and the Zen 3 chip isn't that much further ahead.
Every now and again, we reviewers come across comments from people who maybe expect us to be a little bit kinder to a particular product. If I were to appease these comments, I'd say the i7-6800K is a great CPU, capable of keeping up in modern games. That would, however, ignore the superior options available for the same socket, often for lower prices. If you can get a 6800K, or the almost identical but better binned 6850K to run at 4.5GHz or higher, your mileage may vary, but I found that the 5930K and 5960X can easily run at 4.5GHz even with my rudimentary skills. As a result, they can easily match or exceed the 6800K, and usually at a more reasonable price. And that's not even taking into account new options. An i5-11400 and matching B560 motherboard should consume less than half the power, have better IPC and connectivity, and, depending on where you are in the world, shouldn't cost all that much more. While I look forward to testing more Broadwell eCPUs in the future, alas, a lot of these i7 extremes are holding a disproportionate amount of value, so it may be a while before my 6950X review. In the meantime, check out my review of the excellent i7-5960X. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.